Ah, finally, <laughs> you're awake <laughs> and just in time. For I was just reminiscing about my time in the war. Call of Duty World at War. So many brave men lost. So many friendships broken. And yet cruelly, only the cowards live to tell the tale. To cowardice. Holy Jesus, that is terrible. Ah, where was I? Ah, yes, the war. Well, since I've got your ear and your body, why not amuse an old man like myself and listen to my story? And then we can resume the fun. It all began on the Pacific, 1942. Our story begins seemingly at the end, with two American Marines being held captive by the Japanese military, a fate worse than death. But lucky for them, the Japanese are actually in a particularly generous mood, as they plan to free the men by killing the men. But just as our protagonist is about to become worm food, a rescue force arrives to free them from bondage and thus capture them in their meat suits. And the owner of this meat suit is one Private Miller, a mute American Marine with as much personality as God. So none. And his saviors are one Sergeant Sullivan, Corporal Roebuck and Private Polanski of the American Marines, a special division of the United States military designed for aquatic adventures and ecologically efficient fishing. And with this newfound freedom, Private Miller does what any man would do get revenge, as him and the Marines immediately begin raiding Macon Island, because war is upon us, as the Japanese have committed two unforgivable sins, one bombing Pearl Harbor and two anime, and these sins drag the American military into World War II, because bombing a billion dollar warships is one thing, but this? This is something our forefathers can't forgive. Anyone else rethinking that whole all men are created equal thing? The goal of the Macon Island raid is to blow up various bunkers, cause a little chaos, and get the hell out of there. Sounds simple enough, but there's a catch. The Japanese are tricky. They hide in bushes and pretend to be plants. Like, no fair, fight like a man the colonial way. Wait. Wait. One sec. Yeah, and these tricky tactics allow a Japanese bonsai attack to skewer Private Miller like a wild whale. And so Private Miller lay there, his life flashing before his eyes. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But alas, he was at peace, for he had accepted death all those five minutes ago in that Japanese torture tent. Yet suddenly, amidst his death dreams, a great white hand pulled him from the abyss and dragged him back to safety, for it was Corporal Roebuck once again saving his life twice in one day, which means now Miller owes him his current life and his next life. That's on you. Yeah, that's fair. So Private Miller narrowly escapes with his life and lives to fight another day. And before you could say, hoorah, two years had passed, yet the war waged on and more violent than ever. But time heals all wounds, and although Miller was turned into a kebab, he is now fully healed and ready for action. The new goal? Breach the island of Peleliu, a giant rock in the ocean that apparently is a critical stronghold for the Japanese. It'll be a long campaign, one step at a time, left, right, left, right, left, 
Ao. The first mission within this bigger mission is to take the Japanese airfields and cripple their supply lines. But the Japanese are dug in. They've got bunkers abound and enough bonsai traps to skewer a whole day's worth of hogs. So the question becomes, how do you breach the unbreachable? Grenades? flamethrowers, because remember, the Japanese are pretending to be leaves, i.e. grass types. So the best counter is fire. Oh shit! So Private Miller equips his handy dandy flamethrowers and just starts burning, baby. Yeehaw! That's how I want to die. And behind the power of the dragon, the Marines manage to push the Japanese back towards their airfields, meaning all is going according to plan, which means it's time for some tragedy. This is Call of Duty after all. And right on cue, a rogue bonsai warrior kills the sergeant right in front of my eyes. And man, I am shook. I knew him for like one whole mission. That's like 20 minutes of gameplay and I'll never be the same. Uh, what? So with the death of Sergeant uh, Sullivan, Corporal Roebuck becomes Sergeant Roebuck because somebody's got a lead and it ain't gonna be me. So congratulations, sir, you've just been promoted, meaning that bounty over your head just got doubled, just like your salary. So after weathering the storm, the Marines capture the airfields using their tanks, flamethrowers, and human shields. So, so much death, so much violence, so much XP, but in the end, it's worth it because we've severed yet another limb from the Japanese army, their airfields. But just at the peak of their ecstasy, a noise burst in the distance, drums beating in the deep. The ground shook, the leaves fell, and the marines braced themselves. For a horde of rampaging, angry Japanese soldiers began to descend upon their position, screaming obscenities that I can't understand, but I know are super a duper rude. Hey! Hey! Fuck you. The Japanese assault their position, a mindless horde of weebs breaching the walls and blowing up the barricades. It's truly a scene out of hell. However, when things get tough, just cheat as Miller utilizes my aimbot to stave off the advancing forces, burning through lots of bullets and doing a little genocide. And just as Miller's bloodlust reaches its peak, American planes come in and steal all the glory, using their 5 kill streak to move closer to their 25 kill streak, the game ender and the war winner. But that's a tale for another day. A day like a few few months from now, but while the Americans bask in the glorious blood of their enemies, we must head on over to our other front, the Russian theater, Stalingrad, 1942. Behind Operation Barbarossa, the Germans have launched a surprise attack upon their current allies but ancient enemies, the Russians. A bold move, invading Russia is a tall task. There's lots of snow, little food, and way too much vodka, but the German Wehrmacht have something Napoleon never had. Tanks, a horse's worst nightmare. And like the American story, the Russian story begins seemingly at the end, with a wounded Russian soldier named Dmitry taking a bath in his own blood, clinging to life as the red haze creeps towards the heart of his screen. Crows cannibalize his fallen comrades as German soldiers execute the weak and wounded. One wrong move, and Dmitry will become crow food. Get off, get off me. I'm trying to play dead. Yo, what's up, dude? There's like a crow on your face. Let me help you out with that. But fortunately, Dimitri maxed out his stealth stats and manages to evade the eyes of the German soldiers. When suddenly, a zombie opens its eyes. Wait, never mind. He's alive. It's one of Viktor Reznov, and he 
is on a mission, a very specific mission, a super duper special mission to assassinate the engineer of the motherland's misery, one Heimrich Amzil. Reznov has been tracking him for a long time, but is badly wounded, meaning Dmitri must take the final shot. And hopefully, Dmitri is less Russian than his name, because drunk hands make for drunk shots. That's, that's my bad. And under the cover of the Luftwaffe, Dmitri and Reznov stealth their way through Stalingrad and continue to track Heinrich Eimsil's scent. But what are they waiting for? Well, they need the perfect shot because they'll only have one shot, one opportunity to cut the head off this snake. If they miss, he'll be aware of their plans. So no mistakes, no sweaty palms, no mom spaghetti because sniping on a full stomach is just a really bad idea. Did I, did I get him? No, but all the cheese is gone. But since all the food is gone, Dimitri snipes on an empty stomach and proceeds to decapitate Heinrich Eimsel and usher in an unexpected Russian victory at Stalingrad, shocking the German Sixth Army and beginning the end of the Third Reich. Three years pass, and we resume the war between Russia and Germany, and now it's 1945, and the tides of war are changing, as Dmitry Reznov and the rest of the Red Army advance upon the German lands. It's time for our Russian revenge, a meal best served warm and with vodka. So let's burn the fields, take the crops, and ride the livestock. Eha! We want want to do what the Germans did to Stalingrad tenfold. An eye for an eye, and we'd all be blind, but even a blind man can hit a target. Did I get him? But these petty German fields aren't the end goal. It's Berlin, taking the fight right into Hitler's face with a giant Russian fist. A steel fist, knocking that gross mustache off and replacing it with an iron curtain. But to do that, we must take one step at a time over thousands of innocent and not-so-innocent bodies. The price of war. So Reznov and the Red Army advance behind the power of the Russian spirit and Russian spirits, decimating tanks, bunkers, and all opposition to move one step closer to Berlin. But before this war can continue, we must head back on over to our other front, the American-Japanese War, where Private Miller and the Marines are continuing their island-hopping adventure towards Tokyo. See, up to this point, the battle plans have been simple smash their defenses using our giant war cocks. But now the enemy has retreated beyond the open fields, past the dense jungles, and all the way back to the original bunker, the cave, meaning things are going to go from confusing to downright chaotic, as the caves take the enemy's stealth stats from a 4 to a 10. So now friends look like enemies, and enemies look like friends, which makes my amazing Amygdala, my worst enemy. I think... I think someone just shot me. It was probably the Japanese. And this essentially just nullifies the American advantage. Tanks can't fit into caves. Trust me, I've tried. But behind the grit of Private Miller and Sergeant Roebuck, the American Marines trudge their way through the caves and capture Peleliu, this giant island rock. It took a lot of lives and even more blood, so this random island better be worth it, because I'm literally sitting on an island of corpses, and I still don't know which are friends and which are foes. You know, Todd, sometimes I think... Are we the bad guys? So with Peleliu Island captured, the next touchstone towards Japan is Okinawa, but before we can go there, we need to buy a one-way ticket to Berlin, where the Red Russian Army are doing what they do best, throwing millions of bodies at their problems, the ultimate war tactic. 
Viktor Reznov and Dmitry are leading the assault, but this time we're riding a dirty in a $32 million war vehicle, a tank, the best muscle car on the market, and Dmitry, our Russian protagonist, is leading the mechanical charge. But there's a problem. The Germans also brought tanks, and their tanks are better than our tanks. No fair. But despite this technological disadvantage, Dimitri's war machine has its own advantage. Plot armor, the strongest metal known to man. So Dimitri literally one-man armies his way through the German tank division and decimates an entire Wehrmacht legion, all by himself. Pretty impressive, yet pretty disturbing. Like, is Dimitri a hero or a villain? I surely don't know, and only time will tell. And with the German tanks destroyed, the road to Berlin is laid bare. And boy, is it a sight to see. Berlin has been torn asunder by Russian bombs. Soldiers lay down their arms and beg for their life, putting the power into the player's hands and saying, you decide. And being a gamer, I made the most ethically unethical decision by not making a decision. You should have shot them, Jim. See? I'm innocent! This game sucks. Meanwhile, back on the Pacific front, the next step towards Tokyo is to remove the final cog in the Japanese war machine. We took the airfields, we crushed the supply lines, and they destroyed their own airships. Ouch. And now with the Japanese army severely crippled, we take the fight closer to mainland Japan. Okinawa, more specifically Sherry Castle, the citadel of death and our last mission. We're low on ammo, lower on morale, and lowest on toilet paper. And the leaves just hit differently. This leaf just bonsai my ass. So Private Miller, Sergeant Roebuck, and Private Polanski utilize a network of tunnels to sneak into the castle and capture it. The Japanese soldiers surrender, or at least pretend to surrender, as they suddenly apprehend Private Polanski and Sergeant Roebuck with a grenade set to blow, thus creating our toughest moral dilemma yet. Either save Private Polanski or Sergeant Roebuck. A tough choice. And when faced with tough choices, just close your eyes and flip a coin. This time I'm definitely innocent. What? So Miller decides to save Polanski and sacrifice the sergeant, and blood is now on his hands, but it's okay, because he's already covered head to toe. But Roebuck's death wasn't in vain, for the American campaign was a success. The Japanese would soon surrender, and finally, for real this time, we get to go home. End of story. Close the curtain. The video's over. Wait a minute. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, shit. What's going on in Berlin? Um, he was... He was like that when I found him. So back on the Russian front, Dmitry and Reznov make their final assault on Berlin. They've reached the capital and all they must do is take the building and replace that ugly flag with a beautiful flag, symbolically ending this war. They manage to make it to the peak, but in a cruel twist of fate, at our highest moment, we get shot down. Literally, as a dying German soldier shoots Dmitry right in the dick. A deadly blow, but Dmitri is strong. Russian strong, meaning he drank lots of vodka, so that bullet wound is immediately sterilized. It's science. And so with the aid of Reznov, Dmitri manages to place the flag over Berlin and end World War II. And, and that, that, my boy, is the end of our story which means it's time 
for the end. Fuck. <laughs>